Welcome everyone to our second panel of the day. We will be discussing professionally produced content in just a sec. I would like to briefly introduce myself and my awesome speaker today. Um, my name is Moritz Mena. I'm a lawyer at SKW. I'm also very privileged to head our eSport teams for the moment. And with me today is uh, Daniel from Busse. Daniel is the Chief Operation Officer at the TV channel Sport1. He's also the initiator of the first eSport dedicated 24-7 TV channel, which is since last autumn, also uh, accessible in the pan-European area. Next up, we have got uh, Brandon Snow, Chief Commercial Officer at Activision Blizzard. Hi, Brandon. Uh, Brandon's uh, personal res re responsibility with Activision Blizzard is the whole business side for um, all things eSport, most notably the uh, Overwatch and Call of Duty League. Um, that includes also any digital products or um, sponsorships. Also with us today is Alexander Gigrini, Chief Business Officer of Starletter. Hi, hi Alexander. He also, likes him, he also likes to call himself a man on a constant mission to bring esports to a self-sustaining path. Thank you very much for joining. Last but certainly not least, we have Paul Calder with us. Paul is uh, the head of media rights sales and distribution at FIFA. Paul has been working with FIFA marketing and media rights for almost 20 years now. It dates back to five World Cups, starting with uh, Japan, Korea in 2002. Um, he's also worked on the first uh, on the Sony FIFA sponsorship that founded the first uh, World Cup uh, inter no, FIFA Interactive World Cup. Excuse me. Next, ne if if Paul does not the FIFA main TV uh, ride, he is busy with uh, second screen digital th uh, 3D cinema, 4 and 8K, as well as uh, the mobile broadcast on 3G uh, back in 2006. Most importantly for our panel today, uh, since 2018, Paul has been working with EA on the development and commercialization of media rights with the FIFA Global Series. Welcome, everybody. I, well, I would like to uh, begin this. Oh, sorry. Please, please. Hi. Welcome. Can I? Hi. Hi there. I would like to um, start this panel with a small, yeah, Remembering of my own uh, competitive eSport career back 15 years ago, I was a pretty competitive player in CS 1.6. And I remember my pinnacle of career was when our team got an AMD-sponsored chatbot for the then popular internet, internet relay chat, short IRC. I think we are in a completely different sphere nowadays with uh, everybody coming to studios and arenas, and uh, it's all a big hype. To start this session up, Alexander, I know you have studios in Berlin. I haven't been there. I hope I can come after COVID. But maybe could you give us a better understanding what it means to produce pro professionally content in eSport? So, uh, yes, uh, you, you're right. Uh, we. Uh... Uh, uh, invested heavily back in April 2010 in building 2.5 thousand uh, uh, square meter studio uh, back in Kiev, Ukraine. But uh, in March 2019, we built one even bigger, 3.2 thousand square meters uh, dedicated studio just for esports uh, in Berlin. And um, I would say we are doing this for uh, 20 years. And as you initially said, we would love to see at some stage that uh, esports becomes um, um, economically uh, sustainable, a business uh, uh, which means uh, bringing money to all the uh, participants, all the stakeholders. Could you could you a bit explain for us uh, what uh, a typical day in professional uh, production looks like in your studios? What it involves and um, yeah. Yes. So um, um, this, uh, or better to say, last year, 
was very unusual one because uh, um, uh, studios started to produce uh, and to organize more uh, online tournaments. But before that, uh, it was quite uh, classic uh, um, TV content, video content production, which is not very different from uh, any other, I would say, uh, uh, filmmaking or uh, uh, better, probably the closest example is uh, TV shows, uh, uh, talk shows. Uh, that's uh, the better description for uh, eSports studio events. So the studio production uh, uh, is um, no different uh, from this kind, this type of production. And the typical day is, uh, uh, I would say, weekends. Uh, we even um, introduced a simple and straightforward metric, uh, uh, which we called uh, tournament weekend. Uh, and for example, back in 2018, we counted just for our company, 19 of those tournament weekends. Uh, but uh, 2019, so the following year, this number increased to 45. So 45 tournament weekends all over the world uh, producing uh, esports events and broadcasting them live. And uh, obviously not only from uh, our two studios, but uh, also from uh, uh, concert halls, um, expo halls and stadiums. Uh, so uh, just um, uh, different sizes, different uh, orders of magnitude uh, of those events. Thank you, that, that sounds huge. Actually, that doesn't sound like the average game developer's course, core skills. Though, um, Brandon, correct me if I'm wrong, Blizzard does its own content in Overwatch and Call of Duty. Could you give us a bit, can you tell us a bit how a game developer publisher grows into such a yeah, professional event producer? <laughs> <laughs> not very easily and not very cheaply. Um, uh, quite frankly, it was just organic. Um, you know, Activision Blizzard um, had a very large sort of studio already. If you think about how Blizzard has operated as, an, as a company over its history, uh, it's a much different type of publisher than perhaps um, even Activision, uh, where it has um, game teams, with very little studio usage. Everything is, is done in-house and created in-house. It's been the magic of what makes Blizzard games so good. And so we had that capability to some extent already built into the ecosystem when we launched the Overwatch League. Um, and we've been able to then take that capability and scale it across uh, on the back end of production across now the Call of Duty League, which is starting its second season in just a few weeks. And so the creation of our group, what we call Activision Blizzard Esports, which I, I, I'm the lead of commercialization on, is really meant to be that scalable in-house opportunity where um, within our group, we control and manage not only the production of our events, um, at least for those two leagues. And we do work with third parties for a lot of our other esport properties, including pr big properties like Hearthstone um, and StarCraft. Um, but also the way we commercialize and, 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 and manage the business. You know, we, it, The idea is that we have built a, a unit inside the company that can uh, scale economically in growing and supporting and running our professional esport leagues, um, such as CDL and OWL. Thank you. Uh, Paul, maybe also a question for you to uh, get this whole thing started. FIFA has its roots traditional in sports and traditional sports, but also since you work since uh, 2018 with EA and you stake in esports, when you compare these two and what we've heard from Brandon and Alexander, uh, how do they compare and what role does uh, your partnership with EA play in the production of the content? Um, well, first of all, um, we have a huge series um, called FIFA Global Series, which comprises many events um, for qualification for our pinnacle events, the, you know, the EU World Cup, the Club World Cup, the Nations Cup. Um, so there's, there's a lot of uh, content out there that we work on with EA. Uh, we are endeavouring to lift up the, the three world championships, so to speak, to become uh, sort of the crown jewels of, of, of the season, if you like. And obviously, um, there's a lot of work going into making sure the qualifiers run smoothly, um, given the, the virtual nature of those, um, and making sure that the events are, are ready for prime time, so to speak, in, uh, in a production sense. 
And of course, we've worked uh, quite closely with EA for a long time on that. Um, in terms of how they, um, they they compare, I think esports um, certainly hits a demographic that um, that that our traditional broadcasters are uh, realised that uh, that is is deserting them in droves and, and heading to Twitch and, and other platforms. So um, there's definitely a, a sort of symbiotic relationship between the 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 esport fan and tr- FIFA's traditional fan. And um, for that reason, it's important that we engage them. And I'd say um, the younger, for many people in the younger generation, the word FIFA is more synonymous with the EA game than, than our football events. Um, and we'd like to sort of uh, cross over a little bit and, and see the older fans get more interested in esports and perhaps maybe uh, see the, the younger fans uh, take up a bit more of the FIFA World Cup in, in real life, so to speak. Thank, um, thank you very much. Um, you mentioned prime time. I think prime time would be the right word to head over to Daniel um, as TV channel. Uh, you are usually on the other side of the value chain, and uh, I can imagine linear exploitation of content um, is not always quite as flexible as esport might demand. Um, how does the current professional content um, which is produced by Starladder and Blizzard and FIFA and EA uh, hold up um, in terms of availability, quality and accountability compared to your traditional uh, sports content? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I think um, it's worth to, to go one step back and in order to answer your question, I would like to yeah, well, kind of describe the development process in regards to eSport winning uh, within our organization very briefly. I think you can explain the process basically in, in, in three steps. Step one for me is analysis of the eSport market. Step two was actually our reaction to this market. And um, yeah, the third step is, or the question is, um, where do we uh, see sport one within the eSport ecosystem today? I think historically eSport has a long tradition, um, um, uh, a long uh, streaming tradition. Um, during this period of time, the content uh, used to be mainly distributed on platforms like Twitch and YouTube um, to a very, very specific audience. During the years, eSport more and more moved away from this niche and became a mainstream product with more relevance outside the hardcore eSport fan base. We as Sport One followed this process very, very closely. Mm. And in early 2019, we launched our product eSport One, a premium 24 7 dedicated eSport channel. Um, we are broadcasting today about 1,200 1, hours of live eSport content on this platform. From our opinion, the USP of this platform is that we developed a complementary product to the already existing um, streaming platform as we not only distribute the content, um, but we refine the content as we add a lot of editorial power um, uh, to, 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 to this product. Um, I think for us, this is the next evolution step um, within the development um, of, the, of the entire e, uh, eSports ecosystem. The reason for that is that such a premium platform creates value for all the stakeholders within the ecosystem, uh, system, um, such as um, distribution partners, uh, sponsoring partners, and of course, um, uh, the, 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 the eSport fans. Thank you very much. Just to come back to my initial question, does that mean when you say it's mainstream already, does it already compare to the traditional sports content in terms of quality and availability, or is there uh, is it even? Do you would you say it's even? Absolutely. So I think first of all, it is it is important to to well to to define the KPIs or to define what is actually quality, and um, I, I think um, maybe you can end up with three important uh, uh, things which are uh, producing the quality. Um, and, and one for me is, um, is, first of all, relevance. The second is the um, editorial and production standards. 
And the third one is uh, uh, being reliable. And I think um, we see a lot of development during the last year, um, certainly for the last point, being reliable. So we have more reliable scheduling, which is, as you said, um, very, very important, certainly for a linear platform. Mm. And from a from a commercial perspective, if you say it's equal and the mainstream, you talked about premium platform. Uh, can is is the licensing and exploitation also even? Or when I think of traditional sports, I think of big tender processes with lots of parties involved. Uh, is it the same for esports, or is this at another place yet? Well, I think um, um, as of today, I think we are we are in a different range. Um, I think the project eSport e e One uh, we kind of developed together with our partners, our partners Activation Blizzard, FIFA, and many many others. So um, I, I think um, um, we are not uh, uh, on the same competitive uh, level as we are in classical and, and tr traditional sports. So um, we, we see ourselves as, as in the middle and, 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 and making the, the, um, the, the project um, uh, happen. And um, so um, we are not on the same uh, level as we are in traditional sport. Thank you. I have a, um, a viewer question coming up and I think it leads us quite nicely on in terms of viability the question is is the city based model in esport franchises like Over overwatch league or call of duty league really viable slash especially if the team is not based um in the city itself um maybe brandon i think this is, might be a question for you um sounds like it's geared right towards me yeah, yeah. um so I, i'll answer that but i want to tie it into something um, Daniel was just speaking about on the, on the media side, you know, um, holistically, I think on the com commercialization side for esports, we are, um, at an inflection point in the business where, um, if you look at the traditional sports and how revenue flows through leagues and through teams, sponsorship, which is the primary drive, primary driver of revenue for basically every esport team or tournament or platform um, is not the number one area of revenue for a sports team or for a league. Uh, the Bundesliga's biggest revenue is not its sponsors. The, the EPL is not its sponsors. I worked at the NBA for over 10 years. Sponsorship, while incredibly important, is not the lead revenue source. The lead revenue source is media and media rights. And so to go back to your question about the tender, um, it is incumbent upon uh, the esport programs, the IP rights, the games themselves to demonstrate the value of the audience we have and the audience we can bring to a, a platform. And, and until we do that and do that at, a, at the right scale, it's going to be difficult to move into a model where media is the core revenue driver. Now, I do believe we will get there. Uh, we did go through a tender process. Um, with our collective programming, and we now have a uh, exclusive streaming relationship with YouTube Gaming versus versus our previous partnership with Twitch. Um, and we went to the market, and what we saw is that the digitally native platforms right now tend to be a little bit of a, ahead of understanding how to monetize this audience than we'll, we'll say the big, more traditional linear based platforms. But that to Daniel's point, though. What linear brings that, that the digital side doesn't have yet is really that ability to editorialize, to tell stories, wonderful production, to add shoulder programming around it, to really build this thing and make it look a lot more like you see traditional sports. And on the streaming platforms, there's a lot of work to still be done there. They are great at delivering the content, but what goes in and around it still needs to be developed. So I believe that, that the media side of this has to mature at some point. The rights holders, the owners of these games, the owners of these esports need to be able to demonstrate the value of their audience and understand the value of their IP. And until that happens, um, the the industry itself will struggle long term if, if sponsorship is the only main source of revenue. So to answer your question then on the on the city-based piece, 
there are elements of the city-based piece we still still strongly believe in. And one of those is, is how do you begin to unlock those other sources of revenue, whether they be media, ticket sales, uh, local sponsorship, local ticketing. Um, there are pieces of that when you look at at least from a, a U.S. standpoint, North American standpoint, that there's significant revenue opportunity for our esports organizations and our owners in that type of model. What I will say, though, however, is that we're not so stubborn to think that that model is what we believed it would be three years ago. We see that, that what, what, if anything, what COVID has done is helped us understand ultimately that perhaps there's a balance of where this will all go for us. And you're seeing in both the structure of the new Call of Duty announcement of how our league will be run this year. And you'll see it in the way that um, Overwatch League will be run in, starting in April, that we see the value in more tournaments. We see the value in bringing more teams together in bigger moments and bigger events. Which, by the way, if you then put that into a city-based model, you could see a world where our teams in New York are now hosting a tournament with more teams involved in it that tr- over a longer period of time for more revenue opportunity than perhaps, say, a model where it's it's a one game for two hours and then they're moving to the next city. So it's a hybrid piece for us, and I think we've learned a lot over the last couple of years, but we certainly believe that for longevity and, and purpose of revenue for – uh, the models we have, there's a lot of value in having city-based franchises. Um, but for, without a doubt, we need to be able to be flexible and recognize that that model may have to be somewhat evolved over time. Thank you. I think that answers the question nicely. I would like to go pick this up and go a, a step back and ask Alexander, um, when we just heard the sponsoring is revenue number one in esports, and I believe ticketing or exploitation of the on on site event is second, and then media right comes on. Can you, as a pure play esports company, uh, you basically that's your core business, give us some insights uh, into these revenue streams and what uh, what role the the media the prof- the exploitation of the professional content actually means for you um, as a yeah organizer of tournaments that is not a publisher. Yes, um, I wish uh, I would be able to say that ticketing is number two revenue source. Uh, uh, Unfortunately, it's not the case. Just because uh, in order to sell tickets, normally in terms of marketing spent, uh, you spend the same amount which you have in terms of revenue from ticket sales. So um, it is more or less uh, uh, zero profit uh, uh, revenue source. So the majority is um, uh, sponsorship, uh, and uh, that's a uh, um, uh, curse and bless at the same time, because what we saw last year during 2020 is that a lot of companies who were unsecure, unsure about the future, did not want to uh, um, explore the marketing budgets planned and did not want to spend money for marketing so this uh, revenue source uh, suffered a lot uh, last year. And although the cost side also uh, uh, reduced uh, just because uh, the tournaments were taking place online, the revenue side, uh, as I mentioned before, um, uh, while um, sponsorship sales being uh, uh, the biggest, uh, uh, the greatest revenue source, the uh, revenue side suffered even more. So um, that's uh, the problematic. Uh, right now, esports, at least from the uh, organizer perspective, esports organizer perspective, tournament or organizer perspective, is heavily related on uh, sponsorship sales. And sponsorship sales is quite vulnerable, uh, uh, as the last year showed. So that's why there is a uh, need or even uh, uh, like uh, a must uh, criterion which uh, should be fulfilled that the uh, revenue sources uh, should uh, be diversified they should be uh, uh, more balanced um, like uh, similar sports uh, uh, where uh, media rights uh, should be playing a significant role where ticketing uh, could play much better much bigger role and where merchandise might play some role at the moment, uh, all the other revenue sources, at least from the tournament organizer perspective, could be neglected. 
Thank you. Uh, Maybe to pick up the the all present comparison between traditional sports and esports, a question for Paul as the conduit maybe between these two worlds. Um, do you think um, the media rights could actually be number one in esports as it is in traditional sports? If you compare the the, the different dynamics and yeah specialities. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think I think Brendan made some great points there. As, as a business, you, you can't afford really to ignore a, a revenue stream that big. Um, sponsorship is is the cornerstone at the moment, and and in a way, that's like a lot of niche traditional sports who probably don't have the following to get on on linear TV and uh, would get on linear TV for for no charge to get their sponsors exposure. And the next step up is um, is to go. Um, with a media rights-based um, commercial strategy. Um, I think it's it's a must for the sport. Uh, and, and I think uh, in the future, we will see a, an editorially distinct product come out that is tailored for TV. And I think that needs to that, that needs to happen in the same way that, that the NFL goes on Nickelodeon and, and starts to tailor its editorial tone to, to a younger audience. Esports almost needs to do a, a reverse Nickelodeon, if you like, and, and, and teach the gospel of esports to perhaps older casual fans who don't understand the, uh, the intricacies and the skills required for the sport but are interested in the, the, the association with country, uh, club, maybe city, and um, want to want to hear more about the, the athletes as stars themselves. And that will drive a broader, a broader audience for, for, for media rights values. Um, and in your partnership with EA, uh, what what role does the media rights for eSport actually mean to FIFA itself in this partnership? Is it, uh, yeah, maybe you can answer this. As um, I mean, financially it's developing and we see, you know, a huge upside for it. Um, we've had large broadcasters who take our, our, our main World Cup properties who told us three years ago that they are... Uh, are not not interested in, in esports. Two years later, with the, the the effect of the pandemic, the rise of OTT, the same guys are calling us now and asking, "Oh, what have, what have you got esports for us?" And so, the I think the, the the creation of more bandwidth on the OTT services leads uh, huge opportunities for more content, and they're no longer locked into to a limited number of sports, and and that's where esports e opportunity. Um, lies, and as I said before, it, it, I think it comes from having a different product from what you would see on on a digital um, uh, environment. And sorry, I want to stick to this. If if you um, we have an eSport this free free streaming culture, and we are talking about getting. Um, media on top of the revenue streams, basically. Uh, while free streaming means uh, huge access to a very pro important audience, on the other hand, um, yeah, the culture appears to make it difficult to establish some meaningful media licensing. What is what is your or FIFA's stance on this free culture, free streaming culture, and is it viewed as an extension of your viewership or could this actually be a threat to the established commercial um, structure of the traditional sports? Yeah, as, as an old guy coming from a traditional media um, sales program, I was, I was um, surprised at the breadth of, of digital sort of non-exclusivity. But, but the, more it, the more it develops, you, you see that, it, I mean, that, 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 that the fan who appreciates the the hardcore um, interactive community of, say, a Twitch or a YouTube gaming is probably not the main target of, of, a, of a media rights program. You're, you're really looking at a broader audience, and to, to do that, you need to differentiate the product and have an have a editorially and, and production-wise superior product that someone can sit more sit back and, and watch with the family to watch Germany play against France in a in a in an e World Cup in a in a classic environment, so to speak, and and that is where the value of the media rights for us will, will be driven, and and we will live alongside the, the the digital environment, which is incredibly important because it's a digital game, and so we see that you probably won't max out the um, the media rights without going fully exclusive on on certain platforms, 
but at the same time, there's a, there's a lot of headroom there, and um, it could easily overtake our sponsorship, in my view. Thank you. Um, maybe a follow-up question for Daniel here. You kind of went into it already before. With the free streaming kind of dominating esports at the moment, uh, you said you're in a complementary role as a TV channel. Could you um, uh, explain this a bit more, go a bit more into detail of where you actually see yourself uh, as a player on the market right now? Yes, um, as I said, well, I think the key is to to add value to, to the content. So I think um, it is not about... Um, exclusivity. It is rather about okay. People want to watch eSport One. They want to follow our experts. They want to follow our editorial approach. So um, what we do is to take um, not only the the live stream and um, we um, we put value um, uh, editorial power um, to this content. Um, I think for me. Um, a very good example for the power of eSport content, um, for example, is what we call our personal Mario Götze moment. I think in, well, it was in 2019 uh, uh, where we broadcasted the, the FIFA E-World Cup uh, from London and uh, a German guy named Mo Uber qualified for the final and we produced a huge show um, uh, uh, which received at the end of the day over 300,000 viewers, which is a great numbers uh, and uh, and fortunately Mooba uh, won uh, uh, the match and um, created our Mario Götze feelings uh, for Sport 1 and, and uh, the German sports audience. Um, I think interestingly enough um, um, this coverage created so much awareness um, that we got nominated for the German TV award uh, in 2019 and uh, we ended up with the second place but It shows that um, it is worth to to take editorial power um, to uh, to the live content. Uh, thank you. Yes. Um, just to build on this, do you think you already found your role, or is it more of a beginning of a search kind of? I'm thinking of your recent announced uh, partnership with Amazon Prime. Um, is this? I think it's something new for you. Is it where the the, the journey starts, basically? Yes, I think um, you can feel it out of this discussion. Um, we are on a very, very early part of the product life cycle. So I think we will definitely see development. As we see a lot of development in regards to monetization of content um, uh, within the uh, net Uh, in, 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 in general. So I think maybe we will, uh, we will modify our business model from time to time. But um, basically, uh, we are pretty much under the impression that we are on the right path um, uh, with, with, with our model. And um, I think the uh, success um, adding additional platforms like Amazon and today join in Germany and many, many platforms uh, in, uh, within Europe um, I think uh, they all appreciate um, this high premium e-sport e content on their platforms. And maybe a question, a uh, follow-up question for Alexander. If, if we now hear the media rights, it's all in development, we're not there yet. The value is pretty low, I say low at the moment, because due to the free streaming culture. Does it is it still a focus for you, or does it even make sense to license your uh, professionally produced content to these free streaming platforms, or is your focus somewhere else entirely? Um, at the moment, um, uh, we need live streaming platforms because of uh, eyeballs. So uh, obviously, um, just uh, referring to, to my uh, previous uh, uh, statement that we heavily rely on sponsorship sales mm -hmm. and sponsorship sales uh, rely on uh, viewership. So in order to deliver on our sponsorship promises, we need uh, to increase the eyeballs and that's why we um, uh, depend on uh, live streaming platforms and we broadcast at the moment uh, our content Uh, via live streaming platforms. 
but uh, live streaming platforms is not uh, our ultimate goal. Our ultimate goal is hopefully um, in the future to become break even because uh, uh, telling the truth uh, right now, the only party who pays for professionally produced content uh, are investors. So um, the sponsorship sales uh, um, uh, not uh, do not uh, necessarily or do not entirely cover uh, the uh, production costs. So at the moment, uh, almost all tournament organizers uh, subsidize uh, own production and the subsidies come obviously from the investors. So uh, you would ultimately say that uh, uh, right now the investors uh, uh, pay for the professionally produced content and not live streaming platforms not uh, linear TV channels, no, no any other stakeholders. So that's not a sustainable situation. Um, and answering your question precisely, we do need live streaming platforms, but not because we uh, uh, want to be on live streaming platforms, because we want to uh, increase our sponsorship revenue, and we can do so by increasing the viewership. And uh, we do so uh, by the means of broadcasting onto live streaming platforms. Thank you. And maybe to uh, the one more question to Brandon in this regard. You said you switched from Twitch to YouTube. We see many streaming platforms come and go. Uh, could you give us a bit more insight why you switched from Twitch to YouTube and if there are special advantages in? certain ways that streaming platforms differ from each other or yeah sure you know to, to alex's point the dirty secret in this business right now is investors are propping up a lot of the business not just um <laughs> um you know tournament organizers you know i think um it's not a business yet where a lot of the teams are turning profits in any league and um there's a lot of future there's a lot of opportunities a lot of eyeballs and so a lot of people see where it's going, but right now, I think when you, especially the, what the pandemic has brought is, is the, the, when you look at sponsorship being the main source of revenue, it puts a lot of pressure, down pressure on, on the ecosystem. Um, so to answer your question about Twitch and YouTube, I'll back up one step to say on the media piece that the re until IP rights holders like ourselves, um, I, well, let me back up and say, I think <laughs> in order to start to unlock revenue around the value of media rights, it all comes down to how does a IP rights holder view esports in their world? You know, if you are a game, many of these games started esports and continue to run esports as in marketing engagement tools to drive the game popularity and the revenue sits, the revenue opportunity sits inside the game. So until esports is seen as a as, 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 as we look at it as a self-sustaining ecosystem that needs to be driving revenue and profitability and, 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 and OI in and of itself, um, that will be where we will continue to struggle because games will continue to do esports because they drive engagement into the game and not be concerned about are we giving enough value and driving enough value and creating an opportunity, a new revenue source of opportunity because of our esport? This is why the streaming services have all of these IPs. This is how Twitch became what it is off of the back of many publishers' content. Because in many of our games where they're free to play, it's important that people are playing it and streaming it and engaging in it because the revenue is happening inside the game in other ways, microtransactions and others. So that's 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 going to have to be a shift that people are going to have to look at esports as something that needs to be revenue driving, self sustaining, profitable um, outside of sort of a just marketing tool. Um, as it relates to, to Twitch and YouTube, so we we did make the hard decision to go exclusive, um, and we we did a tender and we went uh, with Google and YouTube exclusively for both of our businesses, and. It wasn't an easy decision because there's a huge community of both of our games on Twitch. But what we see in a partnership like YouTube is something more broad and more vast, right? YouTube gaming, for those of you who follow and track the industry is making, they both have had, Amazon and, and, and Google have had wonderful years <laughs> during the pandemic. The amount of engagement on, 
on YouTube and Twitch has just gone through the roof. Uh, what YouTube brings for us uh, is a real, though, deep breadth of opportunity in how you can build an audience potentially outside of just the core who engage. I think what you see a lot on Twitch is people really the hardcore engaging in your game, engaging in your esport. And what, what we believe YouTube will provide is how you begin to stretch outside into a more casual gamer. Or in the course of Call of Duty, of course, uh, if you take a look at Call of Duty, there's been over 200 million people that have played Call of Duty in its life cycle. It's a massive game, if not the biggest game ever in the world. Um, our job is to drive penetration because Call of Duty Esports has been around for a while. We, we now have the Call of Duty League, which is a new system and a new structure. But how do we drive penetration across just that large scale? I mean, I'm quite old now and I still play Call of Duty and I've been playing it for, for a long, long time. A platform like YouTube, because of its breadth in music and entertainment, has, gives the ability to begin to stretch into uh, a much broader audience. I mean, YouTube is size-wise substantially larger than Twitch uh, when you look at all the other verticals that they're in. So you take that plus the power of Google and what Google can do from an ad perspective. You know, one of the things that we do in our business, we actually retain all the advertising units inside of our matches. So that's a revenue source for us. We're selling media. We're selling ads inside of our games. We have about nine minutes of ad breaks per hour. You can imagine when you bring in the Google ad structure behind that, the power of there. So there's just a lot of opportunity within a YouTube ecosystem and a Google ecosystem that is just different than what a Twitch ecosystem is. Now, what Twitch brings is a really, really, really engaged gaming community. Um, and there's a lot of value there, which is why you see many, many, many other sports being non-exclusive and, uh, on, and on both platforms. Uh, we've decided to be exclusive because it's important for us not only to monetize the business, but to show value back to our owners and drive franchise value, no different than traditional sports. And then we're going to be, we did a multi-year deal because we know that it will take a while to build and grow the engagement on YouTube versus perhaps where uh, the audience is set on Twitch. Thank you. Um, just because we only have a few more minutes left, I wanted to ask all of you to kind of give a prediction or vision into the future uh, and uh, what actually is going to happen with professionally produced content in eSport and what actually needs to happen to make it happen. Brandon, you already went into that a bit in your last answer. Is there anything you want to add to this? Um, or uh... Yeah, I would add one quick thing, which is the benefit that eSports has is a super highly engaged millennial audience that advertisers want, traditional media need to continue to engage with, that the digital streaming services are right now owning. And the ability to take that engaged audience, even though we, it may not be like the NFL can stretch from 18 to 49, if you really look at the 18 to 25 or 18 to 30 range, esports really does well in that demo. The value of that demo is what we have to sell and the value of that demo of how you take it to other broadcasters is where you're going to unlock value. Thank you. Daniel, what does the future hold for Sport One in this regard? <laughs> yes, I think I, I couldn't agree more with what Brandon said. So I think it's definitely the engagement. And I personally experienced uh, the, uh, the, for example, um, Katowice, and I saw a lot of young people loving what they actually do. And so I think we are. Uh, we, we we should proceed. I think we are we are on a good path, and um, I think together with uh, with our partners we will develop. Um, and uh, we have so many learnings um, from from the classical sports, and I see so many similarities. Uh, and and so I think it will be a great future uh, for for esport, um, whether it's on 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 streaming platforms or it's on a pay TV channel, um, it will definitely be a substantial part of the media future. Thank you. Paul, what is FIFA's vision for his board? Yeah, I, I, I fully agree. I think, um, I think in the end you will see the, the major eSport players going exclusive on digital. But the appeal of eSports being so strong for, for linear TV audiences and um, advertise it for that demographic that that the broadcasters will tolerate the digital exclusivity in exchange for a, a, a superior product that they can put on their, on their linear programs. 
and, and it'll be a, a combination of, of those two driving the revenue. Um, yeah, I think I think a lot of sports have a difficult decision to make about the breadth of their exposure versus be fucked if I know. Their, their revenue. Thank you. Alexander, your, your mission and vision, will you share it with us? Maybe for the future, what, what does it hold for independent tournament organizers? Um, it's not probably describing the future, it's it just uh, expressing my uh, wish thinking, uh, which is, um, as we initially started, we just hope that the uh, TV channels, uh, also digital platforms, uh, realize and appreciate the value of uh, esports professionally produced content uh, and will reward uh, this uh, value appropriately. Thank you. I have one more. There was a community question coming in, and I think it's for you, Brandon. I hope you don't mind if I uh, just ask it the way. What is your opinion and what are your experience in dealing with rights violation like Twitch hardly follow up on right violations? Well, maybe everybody can answer, but Brandon, do you have anything to answer to this? Sure. I mean, I'll, I'll try to keep it short and just say, you know, you have to remember where this industry is coming from. It was, it's been just a free for all forever. And um, it has to be inevitable that uh, it becomes more um, professional and more controlled. And we are an IP rights holder. We don't take, we don't want our IP to be misused. Just as the same as musicians and artists want to be paid for their work too. And there, there is no future for it to stay like it was uh, for all of us. And so I'm supportive of what Google or Amazon or others are trying to do in order to remove toxicity, uh, make sure people who have or creators have ownership of their things. No different than if you're a creator as well on YouTube or Twitch, you want to make sure that you own yours as well. Um, I, and I think it has to ultimately happen to be professional and, and grow this industry the right way long term. Thank you. Anything the others would like to add or does that sum it up? Uh, it looks good. So to wrap it up, thank you very much for your input today. It was very inside. I had lots of fun. I hope you too as well. Oh.